Hello from snowy Philadelphia and welcome to Surge's February webinar, Loving Others as Saints, Sufferers and Sinners with our guest, Dr. Michael Emlett. My name is Mark Davis. I'm part of the renewal team here at Surge. If you are new to Surge, we are a cross-denominational mission sending agency. We're committed to keeping the gospel of grace central to all that we do. We know that we never outgrow our own need for grace, even as we take the good news of that grace to the nations, and trust that the power of God for mission is uniquely expressed in the lives of weak people who know they need Jesus every minute of every day. For us, these webinars are one way that we as a mission seek to nurture a culture of grace in Christian communities around the world. Just a few housekeeping items. After the presentation today, there will be time for questions. So at any point in the hour, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. And during the last 20 minutes, we'll take as many of those as we can. You may also notice the chat and raise hand functions on your screen. We will not be using those functions today, only the Q&A function. And it might put some of your minds to rest to know that while you can see the speaker on your screen, neither we at Surge nor other attendees can see you. At this time, let me introduce you to our speaker for today, Dr. Michael Emlett. Mike is a senior faculty member of the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation here in suburban Philadelphia, just a few miles from the Surge Home Office. For a few decades now, Surge and CCEF folks have been in church communities together, learning from one another and benefiting in more ways than we know from friendship and fellowship in Christ, hopefully in both directions. We who are renewal mentors at Surge have benefited particularly in recent years from Mike's work on today's subject. Originally articulated in his book, Crosstalk, published in 2009, and now further developed in his new book, Saints, Sufferers, and Sinners, Loving Others as God Loves Us, published a few weeks ago. Uh, because we found Mike's work so helpful, we wanted to commit it to you as well by inviting him to join us today. And in the show and tell department, Mike is also an amateur potter who crafted this lovely green mug that holds my morning coffee today. Mike, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Mark. Really uh, thankful to be here and, uh, and be with you all. Um, let, me, uh, let me start us out by, uh, by praying. If we could pray together, please. Father, what a, what a privilege it is for us to join together in so many different places and situations uh, of life and ministry. So we ask for this hour, would you join our hearts with one another and, uh, and with you? Uh, Lord, you know exactly what we need today. We come in various ways, uh, tempted, tried, and sometimes failing, uh, overwhelmed, um, joyful. Uh, there are so many different ways in which we come into this, uh, this webinar. So would you meet us, uh, Lord God, and use our time together uh, that we might grow in our ability to love others well. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, everything, just about everything uh, we buy comes with instructions. Uh, pieces of furniture uh, come with assembly instructions. Clothes come with laundering tips. Uh, electronics come with, uh, with operating instructions. And as a uh, non-handy kind of person, I find those directions uh, very, very helpful. Um, but don't you wish that sometimes in ministry, uh, people uh, came with, with operating instructions? I, I certainly do. Uh, other people are complex. Uh, you and, and I are complex. So how, how do we understand uh, ourselves and each other? Uh, how do we move toward one another in, in God-honoring ways? How do we live wisely 
in the context of our everyday relationships uh, and in the more formal discipling and counseling relationships uh, God gives us. Loving others in, in multifaceted ways means that we need to know and understand people well. Love doesn't happen in abstraction, but in, in concrete uh, person-specific ways. But if you're like me, you've found that uh, loving wisely and well is not, is not easy. Have you ever, uh, have you ever had you know, the experience, I, I don't even understand what is going on uh, with this person, let alone how to take a first step in, in helping them. Or what I said made perfect sense to me, but they walked away in anger. Um, you know, have you ever uh, zigged in a relationship when later you realized, ah, I should have, I should have zagged. Um, you admonished when you should have comforted or you brought consolation when actually speaking a, a challenging word would have been the better path of love. We struggle to love each other well and other people struggle to love us too. Now, there's no doubt that the, the shape, uh, the specific shape and steps of ministry to, to each individual that God has placed in your sphere should correspond to the particular realities and details uh, of that person's experience. And we're called to give a word in season, um, not a generic one size all, uh, one size fits all commentary. Uh, but is there is there something that brings uh, a sense of unity and clarity amidst the diversity of of human experience? I would I would say that Scripture does uh, give us a kind of unity and clarity, uh, a kind of trellis for for ministry, a basic structure on which love, whether it's in word or in deed, can grow in, in person-specific ways. And though the Bible is not a, a technical operating manual like the detailed instructions that, uh, that came with uh, the unassembled bike you just bought, uh, it does provide foundational categories that can help you understand others and yourself uh, so that we might live wisely and fruitfully as God's people. So what, what are some of those commonalities, despite many individual differences between us? What is true of yourself and every Christian you meet, according to scripture, right? What can you, uh, what can you be sure uh, about your spouse or your roommate, your child, uh, your friend, the person you're mentoring, even a brother or sister in Christ uh, who is at odds with you? Well, first, you can be sure that they struggle with identity at, at some level, which means they're implicitly or explicitly asking the question, who am I? Um, that is, what is my core identity? How do, I, how do I fundamentally conceive of myself? What do I, what do I highlight when I tell my story? Uh, because this identity question is tied to mission or calling, it also means that they're asking, what is my purpose? Uh, what should I be doing with my life? How should I be living in light of my basic identity? What difference does it make that I am a person in Christ? But second, you can also be sure that they're struggling with, with evil. And this struggle with evil encompasses itself or expresses itself really in two different, uh, in two different ways. Um, they and we experience evil from without, um, that is suffering, uh, which means they're asking, how do I deal with the evil that is done to me? How should I persevere amidst the hardships and sorrows of my life? But they and we also experience evil from within, that is sin, which means they are asking, how do I deal with the evil inside of me? How do I deal with the reality that, as Paul says in, in Romans 7, 21, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Why do I struggle uh, so much to live out of my identity? How do I change? You and I and every Christian we meet uh, wrestle with these questions about identity and evil. Uh, this has been true ever since Adam and Eve deviated uh, from God's original design uh, for humanity. 
uh, thankfully, God brings a, a welcome sense of clarity uh, to this complexity. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I would not give a fig for the simplicity, this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. See, we all want truth that is, that is simple and yet embraces the complex. Uh, Christians are blessed. We are blessed that God in his word offers this uh, to us. So scripture gives us basic but not simplistic uh, categories for understanding our experiences as, as God's redeemed image bearers. So these, these categories of identity and suffering and sin become apparent as we observe in the Bible how God moves toward his people. At a most foundational level, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ applied to our hearts through the Holy Spirit restores our identity uh, as children of the living God, 1 John 3, 1 and 2, and he overcomes evil, whether it's in the form of suffering or sin. But the story of redemption is a lot more fine-grained than simply asserting those uh, foundational truths. Because as we look closer into scripture, what we see is that it models ministry uh, to, to God's people in three distinct ways. And this, I think, in turn helps us to know how to move toward one another so that we're not just guessing or, or flying by the seat of our pants in, in the moment. So what does scripture show us? Uh, we see that God speaks to his people as saints who need confirmation of their identity as children of God, as sufferers who need comfort in the midst of affliction, and as sinners who need challenge to their sin in light of God's redemptive mercies. Saint, sufferer, and sinner. Uh, all three of these are simultaneously true of every Christian you meet. And if this is the way that God speaks to and loves his people, then we want to do the same. Um, using these broad biblical categories uh, to guide our overall approach uh, to the people in our lives. Um, think of them as as signposts for wise love, rather than as a, a kind of ministry algorithm, right? If, if the person says this, then I say that, no. Uh, or don't think of them as categories that will exhaustively describe a given person. Rather, I think they help you prioritize and remain balanced in one another ministry. So keeping this triad of saint suffer and sinner in mind will help you to consider whether the need in the moment with this particular person at this particular time is to encourage, to console, or to confront, or some combination of these three overarching ministry priorities. Now that's a very broad overview, um, but what I want to focus on for the remainder of our, of our time is this question, what happens when we are imbalanced? What happens when one aspect of our human experience becomes the only thing, at least functionally speaking, uh, as we live our Christian lives? And I'm not speaking here about the times when, when God is at work in, in a particular way, uh, which, which can bring one of, those, one of those three aspects of our lives uh, to the forefront uh, of our lives. For example, after, after hearing a sermon, we have a fresh apprehension of our privileges as daughters and sons uh, of God, or uh, we're in a season of great uh, suffering uh, associated with a life-threatening illness, and, and God brings fresh comfort and, uh, and hope uh, to us in, in particular ways, maybe particular scriptures come alive. Um, or times when God's spirit has awakened a new awareness of and, and hatred for a particular pattern of sin in our lives. Uh, that happens all the time, right? That God puts his finger on one aspect of our lives. But here I'm talking about the, the situation when a person lives as though only one aspect of the saint, sufferer, 
or sin or triad really matters because that imbalance will will carry through in ministry uh, to others as well. So let's let's talk about imbalance in each of the three uh, sequentially. Uh, so what happens when we overemphasize the saint aspect of our experience? Okay, what, uh, in other words, only viewing ourselves through the lens of identity in Christ and the accomplished reality of our, of our justification, what could that lead to? Well, first, uh, we'll tend to minimize wrongdoing, responsibility, or progressive growth in godliness. Um, this was years ago now, but I still remember it. I once uh, brought up very carefully uh, to, to a person in my, in my former church something that had troubled me uh, about, his, about his behavior toward me. And his response really caught me by surprise. He basically said, don't you put me under the law. I'm, I'm, a, child of the, I'm a child of the king. Well, for, for that person, owning his responsibility and pursuing obedience were, were somehow disconnected uh, from being a, a child of King Jesus. What mattered to him was his positional standing in Christ that reality tended to overshadow any of the moral imperatives of scripture, at least practically speaking. But we never see that disconnect in, in the Bible. We see, we see a both and uh, in scripture through, through the pairing of the indicative, what, what God has done in Jesus Christ, and the imperative, how he calls us to live in, in light of his work in our lives. But this, but this brother in Christ lived as if it were an either or. What he wanted, in effect, was a, a Christianized version of unconditional positive regard, which resulted in him being prickly and unapproachable in relationships, if anyone even hinted of uh, him doing wrong. So his functional theology had no place uh, for verses like, as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct, 1 Peter 1.15. Ironically, uh, really, and, and sadly, this posture robbed him of the opportunity to taste the, the mercy of Jesus in the midst of his failure, in the midst of um, honest confession of sin. So a second uh, a second aspect of this uh, overemphasis, even if we take sin seriously, the, the main emphasis in progressive sanctification may be reduced to just remember your justification, uh, as opposed to taking concrete and habitual steps of obedience that, that form us as disciples of Christ. No doubt, meditating on our position in Christ does uh, nourish and, and deepen our faith, but we also grow uh, by living out uh, the commands and prohibitions of, of Scripture. Our heart is formed as we do. Consider the active response of the, of the Corinthians to, to Paul's challenge about the, the immorality in their, in their fellowship. This is in 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 12. Words like earnestness, godly grief, eagerness to clear themselves, indignation, fear, longing, zeal, and, and taking appropriate disciplinary steps. And so active obedience, not simply extended cogitations uh, mark the disciples' life. And then I, th I think a third um, effect of overemphasizing the saint aspect of our lives might be that we project a kind of breezy cheerfulness uh, that fails to connect uh, with, with the brokenness and suffering in other people's lives. Now, there's no doubt we, we should exult in the amazing reality that, that God has called and justified and adopted us. No doubt, uh, joy should be characteristic of our lives as believers, as, as 1 Peter 1.8 reminds us. We are his children, and he is accomplishing his purposes in us, Philippians 1.6. But, but living as a saint isn't uh, this abstract, otherworldly, overly cognitive affair, but it is a, it is a boots on the ground uh, kind of experience of life in a world that has not yet been fully rescued uh, from its suffering and sin. 
So groaning over what is fundamentally still broken is a characteristic posture of the saint who already possesses the spirit of adoption, as Paul says in, in Romans 8, 15, and 16. Now, I'm warning of imbalance um, here with regard to the saint aspect of our, uh, of our identity. But in truth, I think more frequently our temptation is to um, is not to exaggerate uh, this foundational aspect of our experience, but to minimize it or perhaps just give it a, yeah, yeah, I know that. Um, just kind of shrug it off. I, you know, I recognize that that's my tendency. Um, but I would argue that without keeping before us the fundamental identity shift that has occurred uh, for those in Christ Jesus, we can't rightly address uh, the experience of, of suffering and sin that marks our lives this side of glory. Without an identity grounded in Jesus Christ, I will view myself primarily as either a victim or a villain. But if I, if I understand myself as a saint who suffers and a saint who sins, and I approach the, the people I'm ministering to in the same way, that, that is really reorienting. Um, and I begin to see, maybe dimly at first, that my suffering itself puts me in the closest possible relationship with my suffering king. And I recognize that my sin is an aberration, uh, a temporary deviation uh, from my true identity. And I increasingly long to live as I was designed to live. So that, that's what might happen if we overemphasize the, the saint aspect of our lives. What about what happens when we overemphasize the sufferer aspect of our lives? When we have eyes um, to see only the hardships of life? Well, first, and I alluded to this just a, a minute or so ago, we view ourselves principally as, as victims. Uh, the only thing that is important in our story is uh, is how others have wronged us or uh, of the difficulties that we face. Uh, complaining about and to others rather than lamenting to God is what characterizes our lives. Our hardship then becomes the, the sun around which our life orbits. Now, no doubt, uh, those who have been sinned against have indeed been victimized, um, all the more so if the traumas are severe. And God, we see in scripture that he has an immense heart for the oppressed and persecuted, which is why God gives words uh, such as those we find in Psalm 10, for example, uh, to people who are being or have been victimized to pray back to him. So verse 14, but you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Or as the psalm ends, O oh Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. So it is, it is wise and good uh, for victims to work through their pain uh, before God and others. And that process may be lifelong uh, for some forms of deep suffering. But here's the question. It, over time, is that, is that journey leading toward a destination that increasingly frees the person from the shackles of a victim mentality? Are people moving toward God more consistently rather than away from him, even if they stumble in a given moment? See, a personal narrative that is focused primarily on the hardship of life is, is centripetal. It's, it spirals inward uh, rather than centrifugal, uh, is spiraling outward. And by contrast, those who have experienced deep hurt and trial and have known the consolation of God are particularly equipped uh, to minister comfort to other hurting saints. So that's one potential impact of overemphasizing the sufferer aspect of our, of our lives. Secondly, we, we can become focused on strategies for escaping 
suffering because we believe that the greatest good is to is to eradicate suffering in our lives now on the one hand that mindset reveals an important truth all history all history is moving toward the extinction of suffering under the reign of jesus christ relief of suffering is a mark of the inbreaking kingdom you see that in jesus earthly ministry but on the other hand, do we also embrace the reality that, that suffering now in Christ confirms our identity as children of God? Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ Wish he'd end just there, but he didn't. He goes on, <laughs> provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now, that is, that is a hard truth uh, to hear and understand and embrace. Um, I, am, I, am, I identify with the man in, in Mark 9, uh, 24, who exclaimed to Jesus, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. But that is what God is up to. In the midst of our suffering. And without this Christ-centered perspective on suffering, we, we actually miss the solidarity we have with Jesus as we suffer. We miss God's refining and transforming work in the midst of our hardships. If we see suffering only as a horrible, meaningless end in itself, we miss that God is treating us as his beloved children, Hebrews 5, 5 through 11. We, we miss that suffering restrains sin in our lives, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. We miss redemption in progress amidst the darkness in our own lives, in others' lives, and in the world. And so a pervasive dread and hopelessness marks our day. Or or a detached stoicism as we kind of wait for our earthly prison sentence to, to end. I wanna be able to affirm as Rebecca McLaughlin does in her book, Confronting Christianity. This is a wonderful quote. Suffering is not an embarrassment. It is the thread with which Christ's name is stitched into our lives. It is the thread with which Christ's name is stitched into our lives. What's a third potential problem with an overemphasis on suffering? We're likely to minimize wrongdoing and responsibility in our own lives. We will underplay our agency as victimizers and sinners. Um, I'm counseling a man who uh, neglected and abused his children when they were younger in the midst of mental health and addiction challenges that he attributes to his own abusive upbringing. And although he laments the estrangement in his relationship with his now adult children, and although he continues to experience shame and guilt uh, over his mistreatment of them, he complains most often about the way his children don't seem to get how hard his life was when he was a young parent. And needless to say, his children are not very amenable uh, to, to reconciliation because he views himself mainly um, as a victim rather than as someone who has also experienced grievous harm on others who are very vulnerable. And then uh, lastly, um, an overemphasis on suffering will potentially lead to living without hope. Uh, we, will, we will hear only the first part of Jesus' statement to his, his worried disciples. In the world, you will have tribulation, but, but not the second. <laughs> Take heart, I have overcome the world. Without having the perspective that God has begun the work of making all things new in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, the, the suffering in our lives and in the lives of those we love will swallow us up. In the already and, and not yet of Jesus' kingdom, the not yet uh, will dominate our lives. The promise of a new heavens and a new earth will seem distant and irrelevant to our lives today, which are marked uh, with so much sorrow and difficulty. So those are 
where we might end up if we're overemphasizing the suffering aspect of our lives. But what happens when we overemphasize the sinner aspect of our experience as Christians? Well, first we'll focus on only on what needs to change rather than celebrating uh, the good that God has already accomplished uh, in and uh, in our lives and in others' lives. We'll, we'll kind of live as, as spiritual scrooges uh, with this internal bah, hug, you know, bah humbug, um, when there's actually good reason for, uh, for encouragement. Uh, or if we acknowledge the good, it, it's this kind of solitary blip in a, in a sea of negativity and, and inner critique. Uh, ultimately will be condemning of ourselves and, uh, and others. Secondly, it's easy to transfer then that negativity onto our view of God. If, if all that really matters is ridding ourselves of, of sin, and if we regularly fail at it, uh, which we will, uh, it's easy to envision God as this harsh taskmaster uh, whose countenance toward us is, is a uh, perpetual frown. We'll always, we'll imagine him uh, viewing us through a film of displeasure, right? We'll, we'll hear him say things like, get your act together, or shouldn't you be done with this by now or over this by now? More than hearing him say, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just uh, to cleanse you from from all unrighteousness. We won't hear him say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Instead, we'll experience him adding rocks uh, to our backpack as we, as we dutifully trudge on. Thirdly, here's another place that overemphasis on sin can go. We will end up instructing sinners, I'm sorry, end up instructing sufferers uh, rather than lamenting with them. Now, there are more benign and more malignant aspects to this. The less offensive version is, what is God teaching you? Um, now, it's not that God isn't up to something purposeful in the midst of someone's suffering, but that's usually not the first and best move uh, into a sufferer's life. Uh, significant hardship is often very disorienting, and it defies ready categorization of the plans of God for this, for this particular person. But I think a more problematic response is to focus immediately on the unfiltered and raw and, yes, uh, even sinful response of the suffering person rather than hearing their cry for help. Rather, how can we move alongside someone in deep pain and lament with them? Now, of course, if over time, as you, as you walk with them, anger and bitterness and, and unbelief are growing, then it's important to carefully address that. But we don't want to miss the fact that deep sorrow often comes into the room with an empty scowl or with an angry scowl on its face. Here's a fourth um, problem with overemphasizing sin, a legal rather than a relational ethos might characterize our lives. Laws and rules and commandments are at the forefront of our minds rather than our union with Christ and the, and the gift of living under God's benediction. And so it becomes easy to fall into a works and performance mentality, even if our confessional theology would never permit us to say that we're saved by works and not by grace. Um, for, for many years in the, in the Christian life, I could articulate and did articulate that I was saved uh, by grace, but I lived as if I were saved by the sweat of my own brow on a treadmill of works. And it's no wonder that I struggled so much with guilt and shame in, in the wake of failure. Fifth, and, and this is related to what I just said, an overemphasis on sin can lead to focusing on concrete rules and guidelines that end up missing the heart. As, as happened with the Pharisees. They were focused on the externals and missed the internal. And that's why we can 
do the right thing and still be insufferable uh, to others and, and not love them well. Another, uh, another feature uh, of our overemphasizing sin is that our reading of scripture becomes very truncated. Uh, we miss the, the beauty and glory of the unfolding story of God's redemption in scripture. It becomes a kind of wallpaper that, that fades behind the question, what am I supposed to do here? Now, of course, reading, reading scripture should prompt us to ask, Lord, what, you know, how ought your words impact my life? But if we have eyes only for commandments and sin and personal responsibility as we read scripture, we'll, we'll sometimes rush to action rather than lingering on and enjoying what God says about himself, which is ultimately foundational for grace-empowered, grateful obedience. We need to remember that scripture is first and foremost, a story of the triune God who inaugurates a rescue mission for his wayward image bearers and his broken creation. It's not primarily a to-do list. And then lastly, a last result of overemphasizing the, the sinner aspect of our experience is that there's no real hope for redemption or, or change. Now, we would, we would never say this, of course, um, but an exclusive focus on how you or others are missing the mark leads to a never enough mentality. Our identity never shifts from sinner to saint. We are our sins. Now, that's how Javert uh, viewed Jean Valjean in, uh, in Les Mis, always and only as prisoner 24601 a parolee who had served 19 years for stealing bread and then trying to escape from prison. That was his only lens for viewing Jean Valjean. And it's no wonder then that he couldn't accept grace and mercy, possibility of change. One last comment here, you know, regarding sin, it's difficult <laughs> to get the balance right. Uh, we should never be satisfied and mistakenly think that we've arrived uh, in terms of our growth and holiness. Uh, we, we do need to take seriously the multiple admonitions in scripture uh, to pursue godliness, such as strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's Hebrews 12, 14. Or God has not called us for impurity, but holiness, First. Thessalonians 4, 7. But God ultimately grounds the call to obedience in the work of salvation he has already accomplished uh, in Jesus Christ, which is then applied in the renewing of our hearts. I think 2 Corinthians 6, 18 through 7, 1 really well reminds us of this relationship. So I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, read that. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And then Paul goes on to say, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. We are, as Christians, beloved sons and daughters. We are saints. And that motivates us to wage war against sin in our lives. I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, keeping, keeping these three categories uh, in view guards us uh, from absolutizing any one aspect of our lives, uh, which leads to oversimplification and, and distortion. And they, they keep us from being imbalanced as we minister to others. David Pallison once said, true wisdom is not marked by a simple accumulation of knowledge, but by a growing ability to hold together complementary biblical truths without allowing any one of them to be eclipsed. Ministering wisely means that we hold all three aspects of our human experience together, even if at a given point in time, we focus on one because that's what is most needful from the person for the person in front of us. But we want to keep all three uh, always in mind. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much. There's so much that's fruitful here.
uh, for us to talk about. I, we do have an, a number of questions beginning to come in and folks can continue to submit those uh, through the Q&A function as, as they come to mind. Uh, let me start with this one. How quickly uh, can an overemphasis shift in someone's life? Uh, can we go from saint to sinner or, or saint to sufferer quickly? Or as you've thought through it, do we each tend to have one of the three we tend to return to, to live in? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it, it, is, it is a process. I mean, we, um, you know, certainly, I, I think I alluded to this earlier, and at any one point, uh, maybe, maybe it's during our devotions or something, one of those three aspects may come front and center, or in our ministry to someone, one of the three may seem like the most, uh, you know, most needful thing in the, in the moment. But I think if we're if we're if we find ourselves tending toward one of the three, and then it it, be, it becomes a place of uh, it becomes a place of prayer and uh, and discernment and and asking God to help us to be more balanced uh, in in that sense. So I don't think it's a you know if our tendency is to is to focus on you know, sin, if we, if we tend in that direction, if we're, if we're hard on ourselves and hard on others, that's, that's part of our own sanctification, I think, in terms of, uh, in terms of growing to be more balanced, both in terms of our view of our, of ourselves, as well as, as well as one another. Good, thank you. Um, maybe you could speak to this a little bit. Um, we, We've talked some about the, the danger of a victim mentality. Uh, is there also in some of us uh, a vulnerability to a Christian stoicism that, that fails to engage our suffering helpfully, biblically? Could, could you talk about that? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, just as we can potentially overindulge in the in in the in the hardships and, and suffering there there are times that um yeah that we that we try to numb out uh from it and that 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 would be that that stoicism kind of dutifully trudging on despite uh, despite the hardships and we just we just don't see that in scripture i mean the the psalms are just this wonderful array of ways in which we engage God in the midst of our in the midst of our sorrows right the the lament psalms are the the largest category of uh, of psalms uh, in the Psalter why is that because God invites us to um, to speak back to him our sorrows um, so stoicism uh, has has no place uh, in the Christian life just as you know, an opposite extreme in terms of, I mean, really, there, there's a number of extremes, right? There's stoicism, you just kind of numb out, there's this kind of breezy, as I said, this breezy cheerfulness where everything's great, you know, hakuna matata, you know, it, or we're just heavy duty, everything is uh, always bad uh, all the time. So I think we don't see any of those three extremes um, in scripture. Yeah, yeah. There are all kinds of things that we need to unlearn, aren't there? That 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 are we almost assume are Christian ways of thinking that that sometimes need to be challenged by things that we never really thought about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. how, how would you approach someone who believes he's a sinner because he's a sufferer? Which I, I take to mean that that who interprets their suffering as evidence of their sin and, and God's, God's anger, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, well, one of the things, certainly one of the things that you see in scripture is that even when there is that direct connection between sin and then consequences of sin that are associated with, with suffering, you don't get this picture of God just kind of folding his hands and saying, told you so, you know, like, uh, like I'm, I'm thinking here of, uh, you know, the, the early chapters of Judges where 
where the the writer records the the cycle you know that happens again and again you know they the, the people of God start uh, start going after idols and then they get uh, they get oppressed by um, by neighboring uh, neighboring nations and then they cry out for God for help and what does God do he he listens and so you know, with that person, I'd certainly want to explore, like, why do they, why are they making that, that connection? Why do they think that they, um, they're suffering because of their, uh, of their sins? Um, but you don't see that kind of, um, you know, direct, I'm going to put it to you, I'm going to put the screws to you because of this. You do see in scripture that God, you know, disciplines us in, in, a, in a familial way uh, through, uh, through hardship, but I think we need to be very careful in terms of how we are um, we're, we're correlating suffering and sin. Um, so I would, with that person, I'd want to explore what are they what are they thinking? What do they what do they see? But in the end, God invites us to come to Him and uh, and experiences His grace and mercy. So um, punishment, discipline. Um, that you know, an angry scowl. That is not the that is not the end point. Well, the questions are flooding in, so I'm going to give people more of you and less of me. Uh, Mike, could you comment on how this specifically applies to parenting? Uh, so kids are born sinners, but hopefully, at some point, God calls our kids into relationship with Him, so then they become saints. How does this, this intertwine with discipline and discipleship for children? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think this. Um, I mean, I, I've been especially challenged in my own parenting by thinking about uh, about this this triad. My my kids are now young adults, um, but I I know my tendency in my parenting um, has been to. Uh, to, to not highlight the good I see, but to focus more on what needs change or what needs to be uh, be corrected. So, um, so I think having again this the triad in mind helps me to be to be balanced. So uh, approaching my my children as as saints, um, as as covenant as covenant children, and yes, there are, there are places that. God is at work and, and need to change. And there are places in which those that need to change rubs up against my own need uh, to change. Um, so, so I think it's a very, it's a very kind of active mindset. And so asking myself, have I, have I been, have I been generally balanced as, as I'm approaching my, my children? Am I, am I listening to what's troubling them in terms of suffering? Am I encouraging them in Christ and pointing them uh, to, to him? Am I, you know, carefully, humbly, gently approaching them regarding issues of, of sin in, in their lives? So I, I do think it, it really, it, it, this is not, um, <laughs> just for formal ministry, mentoring, discipleship, counseling relationships, but all our relationships, are we approaching one another in, in the church uh, and in our family in this balanced way? Right, right. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, Mike, what have you found helpful with folks who seem to be stuck in self-pity? In, in that victim mentality direction? How, how do we break through self-pity? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I mean, the first step is to make sure that we have really understood uh, the, the, person's, um, the person's hardship or suffering um, because to, to kind of dive in in a, in a corrective uh, posture without, do I really get, do I really understand uh, why, uh, why this person is, and it, and it could be, it could be self-pity in the midst of suffering. It could be uh, self-pity uh, in the wake of, uh, of having, of having sinned, right? And they're, and they're beating themselves up and they're living in a place of, uh, of self-pity. That also, that would have a different tack, right? I'd want to especially point that person towards there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why are you why are you still living in this way as though you're 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 trying to self-atone by 
uh, or is this, uh, this as if this self pity is is penance? Um, so it'll it'll kind of depend, if you will, on the the species of uh, of self pity. Uh, so I want to make sure I understand what what has led to that point uh, in the person, whether it's again a place of suffering or a, a place of shame and and guilt after after sin, because that that'll that'll look a little different then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about this? Um, can you talk about our ability or lack thereof to be honest about our present struggle with sin in our Christian communities? What, what allows us to confess our sins to one another and then kind of in a healthy community dynamic? Yeah, I that is um, that's really challenging because we we are we are prone to to hide um, and many of us have experienced times where we've perhaps been vulnerable and found that people don't handle the the fine china of our lives very well and and vice versa for that matter. Um, I think what I've seen in a in a in a community that. That helps foster that kind of that kind of transparency. Um, certainly, if if leaders in the church uh, themselves are modeling that, so as as pastors are preaching, are they are they speaking in ways that um, again in in appropriate ways that they are they are bringing their own struggles to the table and how um, the Lord is meeting them in in His mercy. That's going to foster um, a sense of okay, this is a this is a place where I can actually be honest about my uh, my struggles. So I think you know we we often will will do it uh, in uh, and, and appropriately so in in small and incremental ways. And as trust builds with either a particular person or a particular small group or larger congregation will we'll do that and we'll do that more and more. But, but it can be a couple steps forward and a step back as well when, when we share vulnerably and, and, it's, not, and it's not stewarded uh, well. But mm -hmm. I think that is because that's the call in a sense. We, we seek to, uh, we ask God for help to, to take that risk uh, to, to put ourselves forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a few questions here uh, around the, the subject of uh, the experience of abuse um, and particularly um, women who've been abused um, in marriage or even by Christian leaders. Um, maybe you could help us think uh, specific application to those kinds of experiences and, and how to help people process um, in these categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, um, maybe I'll first, I'll speak from the perspective of the, 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 the victim. Um, it is, uh, I, and I alluded to this earlier in terms of when we were talking about suffering that, um, that some forms of suffering um, are very are very complex, um, and it is a, a long process, perhaps, of dealing with that with that suffering. And so, you know, in working with someone or walking alongside someone who has uh, either been abused as a, as a child or has been a, a victim of domestic violence, that, that's going to take time. And you're likely to see a whole mix of things uh, with, with the suffering, um, you know, a really negative view of themselves. Uh, they might not they might not view themselves um, as as a saint. They may be very they may be very angry. They may be very bitter. They may uh, they may be angry at the Lord and wonder why He has uh, allowed this and how could He? Um, so there's there are just so many facets of of that experience, and so it um, approaching that person as a sufferer first and foremost, I think, is is really uh, is really important. Um, 
in terms of, uh, I think, just thinking about the, the Saints Supper Center triad and, and stepping back uh, in, in abusive situations, like the, the call in that situation is not to um, think, you know, uh, about the perpetrator as, you know, oh, okay, you're, you, 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 um, you're a saint. Let me think about something good in, in your life. The, the call is addressing this oppressive, uh, sinful behavior toward others. And you see that in, in, in scripture, you know, God takes very seriously when, uh, when his sheep are oppressed or persecuted or harmed. And so the call in that, the call in that moment, in that sense is imbalance. Like you, you deal with the sin that is, uh, that is taking place. And that, um, you know, we, we take very seriously. One, one last question question, Mike, and then just one minute's worth. Uh, just as we think uh, in a missional direction, um, not just within the Christian community, but in our interactions with folks who, who don't know Christ, how are these categories helpful? Yeah, I think, I think they are. So on the, on the one hand, um, the saint category is not, uh, is not uh, evident, right? Because this person hasn't come to Christ, but they are, they are an image bearer. Uh, we are all image bearers, uh, fallen image bearers for sure. Um, but that, that still becomes a starting place in terms of a connection that, um, that this person is an image bearer of, of, of the living God. That's, so that's one point of connection. There, non-believers are also struggling with suffering and, and clearly with, with sin. So there are many points of contact and, and suffering is often um, the, the point of contact where we walk alongside non-believers who are struggling. And as we, as we minister to them, that opens up new horizons to be able to share the good news of Jesus so that then their suffering actually becomes a suffering that is in Christ and their, their sin becomes, um, you know, addressed uh, through, through Christ's uh, forgiveness. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much. There is kind of a fire hose of things to think about and interact with and uh, apologize to those for whom we weren't able to get to your question. A um, number of folks have asked if the recording of the webinar will be available at will, and uh, you'll receive an email uh, with the link to that recording, and we can share the slides as well um, for you. So, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so... Uh, as we conclude, let me just remind you of Mike's new book, uh, Saints, Suffers, and Sinners, published by New Earth Press and now available wherever you buy books. Uh, you can also find abundant additional resources from Mike and his colleagues at ccef.org. Coming up next time, the March webinar will feature Surge Senior Director of Mission, Josiah Bancroft, speaking on the subject, Walking with the Holy Spirit. I had the chance recently to talk with Josiah as we made plans. He has some great things to share and I encourage you to be sure to register. Dependence on the Holy Spirit is essential to the way that we at Surge do our work and Josiah expresses that better than anyone I know. That webinar will take place on Wednesday, March the 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Among other overseas needs and opportunities, uh, we want to let you know today that Surge is looking for counselors to become part of Surge mission teams around the world. Uh, counselors meet with believers, including other missionaries, as well as local church leaders, encouraging them in their struggles and walking with them in the ongoing process of discipleship. But Surge counselors also meet with those who are not yet Christians as they seek out counseling for different kinds of hardships and those sessions can lead to fruitful conversations about Jesus. Check out surge.org for more information or to start a conversation with us. By the end of this week, as I said, uh, you'll receive the follow-up email that'll include the link to the recording of this webinar and uh, the resources Mike shared and uh, the opportunity to register for the next one. <laughs>
Finally, if you'd like to learn more about Surge, other renewal resources, access our webinar archive, or learn more about missions opportunities around the world, you can find that information at www.surge.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time.